Thank you again for coming. And I'd like Joanna Macy to come up now. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you all for being here. I'm thrilled to be here with people who understand, because you're here, I can see it, what it has meant to humanity, those living now and those who are going to live in the, if we're lucky for our human journey to continue in the centuries ahead with the splitting of the atom. So I'd like to just reflect for briefly on what that has done to the human mind. The splitting of the atom released, as you know, the strongest binding power in the universe. It kind of held that power that held the protons and neutrons together in the nucleus of the atom. It was like the glue that held the phenomenal world together. And by bombarding that in that unwieldy largest uh, nucleus of any atom, that of the uranium atom, it wasn't that hard then if you had the acceleration and the power to blast off a, a uh, particle from that. And that released this power. That did something to the human psyche. And perhaps all the more so because of why we did it, we as humans. We did it in order to kill. I was uh, found, thanks to a uh, friend of mine, Sewell Woodbury, he found, rather, from Time Magazine, the very month that that happened, that we bombed Hiroshima. This, and it gives something that I'm sure no other news magazine or paper in this country, I can't imagine saying this. It was so raw and so immediate, if you can believe it was in time. Just a few sentences. Because it's good to back up a little and see what we've been living with for the last 70 and a half years. The greatest and most terrible of wars ended in the echoes of an enormous event, an event so much more enormous that relative to it, the war itself shrinks to a minor significance. All thoughts and things are split. The sudden achievement of victory is a mercy to the Japanese, no less than to the United Nations, but mercy born of a ruthless force beyond anything in human chronicle. The demonstration of power against living creatures instead of dead matter created a bottomless wound in the living conscious, conscience of the human race. A bottomless wound in the living consciousness. I think it's still there, that wound. But to continue with writing, the rational mind had won the most Promethean of its conquests over nature and had put into the hands of common man the fire and force of the sun itself. Is man, this is written in 45, so we're just going to leave it with that gender. <laughs> Maybe I won't. So is our humans equal to the challenge? In an instant, without warning, the present 
has become the unthinkable future. Is there hope in that future? And if so, where does it lie? I've become convinced, my friends, that our relationship to both space and time have been altered by that ripping apart of the nucleus of the atom, that release of the strongest binding power in the universe has changed how we relate to each other and into space and in time. So just for an example, from uh, currently in the United States in relation to Fukushima, spatially, we have been accustomed to uh, protecting and identifying with the land that we inhabit, that we consider ours. And yet within weeks, the monitoring stations along the west coast of this continent, of our country, were put out of, were turned off, because that might offend the nuclear industry. Our relationship to our own land was altered. And our Secretary of State at that time, as I understand it, signed the very day after Fukushima an agreement with the Japanese envoy that we would not limit any of the imports of Japanese products, which has ended up with the result that we are allowing into this country and consuming foods that can be measured up to 100 millisieverts, whereas in Japan itself, anything more than 10 millisieverts have, are, are considered too dangerous. So we are having in our shops uh, 10, 12 times the radioactivity or the, the, uh, that's allowed in Japan. So just be, with the release of that's changed our relation to what we consider to be our lives or who we are in relationship to uh, our being Americans or our being uh, inhabitants of this land, protecting ourselves and each other. We are delivered into something quite international, which we have been learning how powerful that is when we see this nuclear mafia or nuclear corporate a lobby. So there's some sort of no limits there. It's like this uh, release of the strongest binding powers, erase the limits, erase the limits in terms of space, what is ours to be and protect and keep healthy, and also time. And this has had the biggest impact on me, as those of you who've worked with me and in the work that reconnects, you know, and in the guardianship project. Because with that, for the first time, we have seen that we have actions that last forever. It's like our karma, the consequence of our actions, extends virtually forever. Now that's been followed by the fact that there those lack of limits in time to what we can do and the damage we can cause has been considerably brought forward in genetic modification and in fracking. As you know, what we mess around with the gene, gene code or with the chemicals in the underground waters, you can't remove that ever. So that it's like the future itself becomes a prey to our greeds and our hatreds, both in what, in what we make and in what we do. So as scary as this may appear, it's also a great gift. And this answers the question in that Time magazine uh, editorial of, of uh, August 1945. Where does the lie, hope lie, it asked. Where, uh, where is the future? How can we care for the future? It's become 
evident for me in a recognition that the future is brought right into the present. That the actions we take out of fear, hatred, or greed, or delusion last till the end of time virtually. Like take depleted uranium with a half-life of 4.5 billion years. The age we impute to the earth itself. And so we are, what that does is that brings the ancestors and the future ones into this moment. They're no longer out there. They're right here. And one of my teachers, Sister Rosalie Bertel, wonderful uh, Roman Catholic nun, she was of the gray ladies and one of the top, if not the most uh, sharpest radiologist on the planet. Such a fine expert witness. I remember her at the hearings on Chernobyl and many a trial of any nuclear activists, and she said, every being who will ever live on Earth is here now. What? Where? In our ovaries and in our gonads and in our DNA. The future is wired into us, is biologically present in us, and the decisions we make now about what the future ones will probably call the poison fire will have everything to do with whether they're born safe and so of sound of mind and body to thousands of years to come. So when you hear Mary Beth tonight and Arnie and Maggie, I don't know if Maggie's going to talk, but you, bet she, you better corner her if she isn't here. Listen to them as if you were listening on behalf of the ancestors, especially the future ones. Because with the splitting of the atom, it's like the whole human prospect, that whole adventure that's been ours, it seems so long, you know, how many <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years, millions, it could just go like that. And that they're with us now and that we, as we have found, so what, there's the nuclear guardianship project that took birth uh, a little over a quarter of a century ago and is now coming to life again in another birth around particular uh, challenge, that of the uh, Rocky Flats uh, bomb factory that was dismantled uh, back in 88. But the area that's in uh, hundreds of acres are drenched in plutonium. A very uh, inadequate cleanup, what they call cleanup, and then to DOE, Department of Energy, to get rid of it has, if you can believe it, and it's true, has just granted it to Fish and Wildlife Department for a wildlife preserve and a public recreation area. Take it off their hands. And so around that has resurrected again this notion of being guardians. We can be guardians of this poison fire of radioactivity, remembering what it is, learning what it is, Figuring out how to protect yourself and keeping the story going, not hiding it for the sake of the future ones. And in doing that, you can experience the future ones with us. Because if you act on behalf of the future ones, you feel them with you. And so as you listen tonight to Mary Beth and to Arnie, feel the future generations present in this room and at your side, because we're going to need their claim 
on life to be present for us, to give us courage and strength and gladness for the work to be done. Thank you. Thank you.